So first, I want to thank Natasha for uh, bringing Mark and me into class this morning. Um, my name is Neil Schwartz. I'm president of SBRNet, and I'm here with my uh, my partner and uh, my friend and uh, someone that's really going to bring a lot to these discussions today, uh, Mark Sullivan. Mark's, uh, say hi, Mark. Hi, Mark. <laughs> so... As, as I guess I should say professor, as Professor Brisson said, uh, we actually met a couple of weeks ago in Las Vegas at the Sports Marketing Association conference in, uh, at, in Las Vegas. I said that, I guess, already. And, uh, you know, as we got to talking, um, Natasha said, geez, it would be great for you to come in and talk a little bit about how data fits in with your projects uh, to the lesser extent your project that you're doing and helping sell tickets, but to a greater extent uh, your sponsorship projects. Mark, do you want to talk a little bit? Uh, my background is I am, uh, I've been in, in research about 30 years, Mark in research about 24 in sports. And I have to say, I've been lucky to work with a lot of great clients, a lot of great situations, uh, and I've done a lot of great research, uh, quantitative, qualitative, uh, but I think my number one attribute or the number one thing I'll bring is that helping you kind of create this sales-driven, data-driven sales approach, and you know, hopefully that's what we're going to get out of today. Mark, you want to talk a little bit? Sure. So I came, uh, I don't know if a couple of you heard me talking to a uh, professor before uh, we got started, but I actually came to sales uh, later in my life. I am a, a journalist by training and uh, probably in my late 20s, early 30s, I was editor uh, of a publication and they promoted me from uh, being the editor to being the publisher, which that means I was responsible for the entire P&L I oversaw sales, I oversaw marketing, I oversaw audience development in addition to content. So all of a sudden, without a lot of training, I was thrust into uh, a sales role. And uh, again, for those of you who might've heard the, the tail end of what I was telling uh, Professor Brisson, uh, the first time I went on a sales call with a salesperson and she went into her pitch, I got a stomach ache. I was, I was that uncomfortable with it. So, but now years later, I am, uh, I am an aggressive uh, salesperson myself. And I was telling Natasha, it's like, I don't get stomach aches on sales calls now, I give them. So i um, happy to talk to you guys in a little bit about, I have a lot of experience selling sponsorship package, integrated sponsorship packages, and uh, really, really happy to talk to you guys about that and answer any questions you have about that. We know that all of you were looking to get, hopefully, that job in sports. And, you know, Mark and I, based on our experience and also based on a number of the interviews we've done recently for our My First Job in Sports web series, which, by the way, um, we're all going to show you how you can access that. But we've learned that sports is a great way for you to kind of, you know, work your way into that all-important first job in sports. So. Um, you know, without further ado, what I'd like to do is to share my screen. And I'm doing that right now. Give me one second. Is everybody seeing my screen? Anybody? <laughs> is everybody seeing my screen? Yes. 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 Okay. I, I got a lot of thumbs up. Okay. I, sorry, I didn't see that. I was actually looking away for a second. So you are already subscribers or you already have access to this great platform of data called SBRNet, stands for Sports Business Research Network. And we it is known as the Sports Market Analytics Platform. We're a little bit schizophrenic in that we believe we have two names. But our goal is to provide you as a student with a place where you can come in order to get data for all of the different projects, all of the different assignments, and then even once you're working, again, another platform where or a platform where you're able to access all important data 
that you need in order to accomplish your assignments. And we have data on a wide variety of areas, but I'm going to focus specifically on what Professor, Professor Brisson kind of gave us a little bit of a heads up on is that you're all going to be working on a sponsorship package for the San Antonio Spurs. And how can you integrate data into that process? So again, data is a wonderful tool. What I have found, and like Mark says, when he first went on sales calls, he was, you know, he got a little upset stomach. For me, I have been on thousands of sales calls and I have always found that when I lead with data, I always find I'm able to break the ice a little bit to impress the person on the other side of the table that I've done my homework. And I cannot stress that enough. Most of the sales calls I've ever done, I never open up a notebook in the beginning. I never go to a PowerPoint presentation right at the beginning. I want to sit down and I want to ask questions based on what I know. But how do I find out what I know? So in this case, the sports market analytics platform gives you access to a wide variety of data. Fan data, participation data, product sales data, you name it. So where I like to start first is actually is in my little search box up here on the right hand side. And when you start, I like to try to start as wide as I can. Um, you know, maybe we start with the NBA. Oh, NAB. Everything starts at search. The reason why is that when everything starts at search, you get access to find out what exactly is available to me. So for instance, we always start with articles. On the left-hand side, this is pretty up to date. The last article posted about the NBA was from 10-29-2021. So again, it gives you a little bit of an opportunity to first understand what are people talking about when it comes to this particular topic. It's very interesting that the number two story here is about the Dallas Mavericks. And they have agreed to, uh, you know, something with a company called Voyager to do their gambling hub. So, again, it gives you a really good understanding at the highest level. What's going on? What are people talking about? What are some of the things that I might be able to talk about early on? We then like to get into research. What are the research you know, the re what research do we have that we can use to better understand who we're talking to? You know, I can click on the very first, very first piece of research. What do we have here? We're looking at attendance figures for all of the NBA teams from 2011 all the way to the current 2020. Now, look, we know the 2020 was an oddball year. Mark, you want to talk a little bit about what we did in order to kind of compensate a little bit for 2020? Yeah, sure. So one of the things, sort of our, our one of our calling cards at SBR Net is we do uh, exclusive research every year on fan behavior. You know, we spend a lot of money and we put a lot of time into it. And it's, you know, for subscribers, it's one of the main reasons they subscribe. So shortly after Neil and I bought the business last year, it was time to do our fan study. And it was a, a challenge for us because, uh, you know, the most fan-like behavior, which is attending games in person, we really couldn't measure that because so many people were unable to attend games in person. So we really doubled down on some other uh, questions and some other areas in which people can engage with sports. And that included uh, sports gambling, that included social media consumption, included fantasy, esports. So we really have, uh, as you poke through the site, you'll see we really have some great data there. And ultimately, when you're selling sponsorships to people, 
I think what they want to know is, you know, what sort of engagement level do they get? There's always the the old axiom in uh, marketing, you know, and I've, I've sat across the desk from, you know, big time marketing guys at Nike and New Balance and Under Armour and a lot of the big companies. And, you know, what the conventional wisdom says is, hey, 50% of my marketing budget is wasted. I just don't know which 50% it is. So I think one of the points that Neil is making is when it comes to data is, you know, more and more in today's marketing world, people are looking for real systems of measurements and real systems of return. And I think data can help you on both the front end and identifying your audience and sort of selling the strength of your audience. And then ultimately on the back end of helping people really measure, you know, and, and generating, you know, uh, a report on what their exact uh, return on their marketing investments with you were. You know, Mark brings up a good point about that 50% rule is that I think that 50% of my marketing budget is being wasted. I just don't know which 50%. Well, guess what? If you can help your sponsors, your advertisers, your marketers understand a little bit more about the market, guess what? You're going to be able to be a lot more successful. So what I like to do is, again, I like to go into learning as much as I can before I'm even prepared to start a presentation. So in this case, what I did was I went to our, what we call over here, I went to our fans, teams, and leagues area. And I clicked on that. Now, I don't want to talk, I don't need golf information. I don't need racket sports. What I need are team sports. And what I really need is basketball. So what we're looking at here on the top section are all of the things that we have access to or that we can give you access to when looking at the NBA fan market. So again, you can take a look at, you know, attendance. In this case, we're going to look at attendance profiles. So we're going to look overall at the NBA, but we're going to get into team, favorite team information in a minute. So we give you the ability to be able to understand, again, who are NBA fans? Who are the people that they will most likely be talking to? Who are the people that watch um, NBA events or NBA sports? So again, it really gives you a good background about what's going on. Now, the other place where you can go is right here. We offer a premium service. You are already subscribers to this premium service. Oops. This gives you access to our fan study data without having to necessarily look at a lot of other data points and somehow or another get, you know, distracted or, you know, less focused than you really want to be. So if you went to basketball and let's just go to the 2020 NBA study, you again have access to this. We're going to open it real quickly. So in here is really all of the information that you need to know when it comes to understanding NBA fans. You know, we can look at things like favorite team. So what is the favorite team? And well, this actually, I'm sorry, I looked at the wrong thing. How about that? Let's go back to contents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, you can get favorite NBA team. So again, you can understand exactly what you know about the San Antonio Spurs. I believe these are alphabetical. At least I hope they are. Of course, they're not. Did I pass it, Mark? 
Uh, I'm having trouble reading it, so I. Oh, my bad. Do I make it bigger? Absolutely. Okie dokie. So, San Antonio Spurs, line 63 starts and it ends at line 66. So, you have the ability to then look at all of these different areas for NBA teams, whether it's esports, gambling, uh, sponsorship influence. And by the way, this is a big area because what you want to be able to understand is what sort of an influence can the San Antonio Spurs have on advertisers. So looking at data regarding the San Antonio Spurs would give you a huge opportunity to be able to understand exactly what's going on with that team. Now you can also cross over and determine what team you want to look at. There is also a piece of data that Professor Brisson, I will make available to your class that is really very unique. I should have had that ready. Of course I don't. Give me one second, please. So maybe while Neil is, yes. uh, is digging up that data point, um, you know, look, uh, basically what he's talking about here is identifying the audience and, uh, you know, really uh, coming up with uh, a lot of data points on who the audience is. Because for me, as a potential sponsor, you know, whether it's with the San Antonio Spurs or whether it's with a road race or, a, you know, a car race or something like that, I think, you know, number one, I want to know who I'm reaching and, you know, the how I'm reaching them through sports is a, a big deal and it's very powerful. But, you know, again, uh, me as not your sort of traditional salesperson, when I went and sat down with a potential client, you know, whether it was Nike or a car company or somebody like that, I would always try and get a sense of what their objectives were. You know, what were they looking to accomplish? And a lot of times with sports marketing uh, sponsorships, it is the most basic thing. Um, hey, I'm just looking to capture uh, information. I'm looking to capture leads. So a lot of times you'll go to a professional basketball game and you will see people set up with some sort of uh, activation in the, uh, the hallways of the building. And they're really just capturing, you know, email leads and that sort of thing. And anything they can do above and beyond that is great. But a lot of times it's as simple as I'm looking to capture leads. Oftentimes then it gets, you know, it gets a little more developed. Hey, I'm looking to change my perception. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys watch uh, car insurance commercials, but there's uh, a car insurance company out there called The General that uses Shaquille O'Neal as its spokesperson. And they used to run this really goofy campaign with a cartoon character. And what they found is people weren't really taking them seriously because their campaign was so goofy. So, uh, you know, a lot of times I think people use uh, marketing to, hey, this is how I'm currently perceived. And they want to move it to how they want to change their perception. Um, and and that's, a, that's a big part, I think, of why people choose to use sports as well. One of the things that we're talking about right now is a word that's being thrown around a lot is engagement. How engaged are the San Antonio Spurs fans to a variety of different areas, whether it be, uh, you know, gambling, whether it be social media usage, whether it be watching on traditional TV, whether it be watching on streaming media, whether it be you know, watching on a tablet, computer, smartphone, all of these different things. So let's hypothetically say one of you is going to go do a sponsorship package for one of the cell providers, AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile. I'm sure I'm missing a bunch. Consumer Cellular, I guess they're the ones that are hooked in with Walmart, I think. So you want to be able to go in look at the San Antonio Spurs fans and be able to measure their engagement, which will lead you to be able to make a good story about why that advertiser, cellular phone company, should pick the San Antonio Spurs. 
why the Spurs may in fact be a better place to put their money than let's look at the Dallas Mavericks. Now, I don't know this to be true or not. So approximately 1.922 million watched any of the Dallas Mavericks. San Antonio Spurs, 1.604. So again, you have the ability to be able to compare how San Antonio Spurs fans measure up. Because that's really what people want to know. How engaged are they? Are they more or less engaged than, say, Dallas Mavericks fans or Houston Rockets fans? There's looks like there's, uh, you know, both the Rockets and the Bulls have a nice fan base. Uh, San Antonio, I believe, is a smaller market. Am I, cor am I not correct, uh, Professor? Oh. That's okay. She's on mute. So, again, being able to take the numbers. Now, Mark accuses me of this all the time, and I don't want you to make the same mistakes I make. The one mistake I try to make, I make a lot of times, is I try to take too much data and prove to people how smart I am. That is not a good approach. What is a good approach is to find those one or two or three or four data points that you need that you feel will make your story. And when I try to make a story, I am always looking at a little bit. I have, I have kind of a couple of little things that I do, little kind of tricks. One is I'm always trying to answer who, what, when, where, why, and how. So in your sponsorship packages, if you answer all of those questions, who are the fans? What are they doing? When are they doing it? Why are they doing it? Where are they doing it? Who, what, when, where, why? And how are they doing it? Are they doing it, you know, are they watching games on TV traditionally? Or are they watching them via streaming? You know, what percent of, P of fans were actually going to games, you know, maybe before the pandemic started? And then what happened once the pandemic started? Now, obviously, attendance during 2020 went, you know, really down. But you know what? The San Antonio Spurs attendance, funny thing is, didn't go down as much as some of the other markets for one reason or another. But again, if I can answer who what, when, where, why, and how, I will have done my job. I feel that I will be ready, and you would feel ready, in order to go make a presentation to any sponsor. Yeah, Neil, let me jump in. I you think bet. also one of the things that the data is uh, helpful for is identifying um, potential, uh, potential sponsors. You know, I, I'm looking at some of the uh, information you're flashing up there, and I'm just going through my head are different companies that sponsor uh, my hometown team, uh, the New York Knicks. So, you know, uh, grocery companies, you know, for example, official grocery store of the New York Knicks, you know, sports gambling right now, uh, obviously a, a big one, but they also have, uh, you know, different car companies, uh, soft drinks, you know, all, all that sort of stuff. And, uh, you know, I think the different data sets that Neil's showing sort of speak to different things. If I'm a, a grocery company, I'm probably more interested in reaching uh, women, right? Because women are the CEOs of the house and, and they drive a lot of the grocery decisions. If it's something like cars or consumer electronics, those are going to skew more to sort of uh, male buying behaviors. So I think sort of uh, drilling down on the data and really identifying who the fans are. I mean, professional sports fans overall tend to be sort of uh, an affluent, uh, more affluent than the uh, typical consumer. But I think what Neil's showing you here and, and really drilling down to sort of the nuances of the data will really allow you to target, um, you know, a lot of the different groups and create better matches for your potential, uh, potential clients. 
One of the things that you might be able to do, for instance, in that who, what, when, where, why, how scenario is also talk about different ways to get the message across. So what did I do? I would compare, let's say, maybe TikTok usage of the San Antonio Spurs fans versus, say, other fans. You know, the interesting thing is they do index pretty high when it comes to uh, utilizing TikTok, um, you know, as a platform. So again, you want to use the data to support the recommendations that you are going to make. Yeah. I think also one thing I've discovered um, in selling sponsorship packages over the years is, uh, and, and the company that I used to own, we were uh, among the first to do this we used to sell what we call bundled packages. And, and at the time, the concept was like, oh my God, you know, revolutionary. But, uh, you know, we used to run a, a major trade show in Austin, Texas, and we would sell, uh, a, you know, we'd sell the physical space, the exhibit space. We'd sell media packages around it as well for the different media properties we owned. And then we'd also sell on-site activations and to me, the most fun aspect of all that was sitting down with the client and brainstorming and coming up with uh, on-site activations. You know, what are, and that usually would speak to their specific needs, um, but we could also do some creative stuff. And I have to say, you know, now that live sports are really coming back, you look at um, how people are activating on-site. And I think people on one hand are doing really creative things, on the other hand, they're limited because the things they used to do, uh, number one, have gotten tired, and number two, maybe people are a little squeamish about them because of uh, because of the pandemic. Um, in this group, I don't know how many of you have ever been to a NASCAR race, but uh, I think NASCAR and its sponsors do a fantastic job of uh, you know offering a great experience for the people who come to their events but also doing a fantastic job of activating for all their different sponsors. I have a question by raise of hands. How many of you have been to a live sporting event? Let's say, I don't know, since in 2021 at all. And that can include, by the way, a Texas A&M football game. So that's a pretty good number. So, Understanding, again, as we come out of this post-pandemic situation, who's going to the games? You know, attendance, we have that. Who's most likely to attend games? Right now, gambling. You know, Mark talked about this whole activation idea. How many of you, when you've been to a live sporting event, again, by show of hands, have seen, like, you know, people sitting at a table trying to generate some you know, activation, maybe cell phones or something like that. I'm going to raise my hand because I've actually signed up. Credit cards. Happens all the time. Cell phone activations. Now you're going to start to see people in, you know, gambling services, fantasy sports. So again, you're going to be activating fans. You've got, there is a, we are in this whole new world that advertisers can now access when it comes to activating on fans. It is not like it used to be. So again, the, the pandemic has created a lot of challenges. It has also opened up a lot of opportunities. Um, Natasha, do you want to uh, open things up for questions at some point? Yeah, apparently when I hit the space bar, it doesn't let me unmute myself. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yes, let's open it up for questions. I have one uh, on the, can you go back over to the sheet with all the numbers on it for a second? Can you say your name for me? Is that oh, Will, sorry, Will. Oh, okay. Thanks, Will. Um, on that sheet, what do the, num the two numbers underneath that top number mean? What do you mean like in here? Yes, like the like the the four point like on the far left, the four point one to forty five point seven. What would that entail? So one would be what they call the vertical penetration, and the other is the horizontal penetration. So how many total fans, and then what percent 
um, in terms of, uh, you know, so one's vertical. So for instance, let's go, to, let's, let, let's, let's get somewhere here that makes sense. So of the total, let me get this right, total watched. Okay, of the 259,000 that typically watch a Los Angeles Laker game, that represents 18.4% of all Laker fans. You with me? So this is the percent, 18.4% of all Laker fans tune in to watch games. But that's only 2.2% of all NBA fans. So they are just giving, it's a vertical, vertical number versus a horizontal number. Thank you. You're welcome, Will. I will also throw something out there that um, I'm going to send, by the way, uh, Natasha, or, I'm sorry, Professor Brisson, I'm going to send to you um, a couple of files um, that will make, you know, your students' lives a little bit easier. Um, you know, please feel free. But look, we'd love to have you go on the site. Um, that's really where all of this data is combined. I think it's really important. Um, you know, to use the tools that are available, you know, use the search feature. Saying it, did I spell? Oh, no, I did not. You know, use the search feature. That's what it's there for. See, now this is weird because this should have come up more. All right, I got to work on that. Something's obviously not hitting the, uh, something's not hitting the, what do you call it? Something not hitting the keywords. But again, these are all the relevant articles lately where the San Antonio Spurs, uh, that's actually Tottenham, the soccer team. But, you know, Greg Pop Popovich, um, again, talking about specific things about the San Antonio Spurs. But Mark, I think I have to figure out why it didn't bring the data up. Yeah. So yeah, if, I, if I could just talk a little bit about sales in general. Go and, for it. Uh, and again, I, I'm a person who never in my life, certainly when I was in college, never thought I would uh, be involved in sales at all. And, um, you know, I, I would say, uh, you know, for me, it was a great experience. Uh, you know, I, I uh, really kind of increased my confidence level and my uh you know, look, it was risky for me to do it. And uh, I had to sort of stretch myself personally to do it. And, um, you know, the, it sounds almost corny to say, hey, my job gave me personal growth. But, you know, in the certainly in the aspect of getting involved with sales, that really uh, did that for me. Um, and, and I would say a couple other things. Um, and we were talking before class started. I think for a lot of you who will eventually go up into uh, management roles in different companies, I think to have that sales experience under your belt, it's almost mandatory, you know, to be a, a C-level executive, you know, uh, a CEO or a president or a COO and not have that, um, that sales experience under your belt. Uh, it's very difficult. You'll certainly be a much more effective leader and a much more effective manager if you can understand the challenges that your sales force faces and um, better yet have some, have some expertise you know, in that capacity. We produce a series called My First Job in Sports. And if you go down the list and look at our first, you know, the first year of the folks we've interviewed, I'd say, Mark, wouldn't you say at least 50% of them got into the business through the sports side of things, or through the sales side of things? Yeah, absolutely. And also, um, you know, that, that is a, a great place. Sales is a great place for entry level because, uh, again, I think until I got involved in business, you don't, you don't sort of realize how important sales, sales are and uh, how, how important the sales function is to, uh, to most every organization, whether it's on the sponsorship side or the season ticket side, because those, uh, those are two of the major revenue drivers for most, uh, for most uh, sports teams. You know, the other thing I want to talk about is, adding some qualitative aspects to your work. And one of the areas of qualitative aspects 
I like to say is, hey, maybe, you know, reach out to some of the executives at the San Antonio Spurs. We give you, at least I hope I do, now we do. We give you a directory of people that work at the Spurs and we try to keep it as current as possible. Here we go. So we've got two people that, you know, we have in the database currently that work. So, you know, maybe reach out to those people. Maybe hit them up on LinkedIn. You know, maybe, you know, try to be, you know, try to, you know, become, you know, or befriend these people or try to talk to these people. Because again, they can be wonderful assets when you are looking to help, you know, create your sponsorship packages. You know, if you, just being able to ask a couple of questions to, you know, Becky Kimbrough or Tom James about, you know, who have you been successful with? Who have you not been successful with? You know, what are some of the newer advertisers you've brought on recently? You know, what sorts of sponsorships are selling the best for the Spurs? You know, is it in stadium or is it something else? So again, being able to find out exactly what it is that, you know, you can answer more of those questions that who, what, when, where, why, and how. And that can be a good source, I might add. Mark, anything you need to add to want to add to that? Uh, nah, if, uh, if anybody has any more questions, ha happy to answer any questions. You bet. Uh, the, Professor Brisson knows where we are. Um, if any of you want to reach out, um, you know, you can easily go to the website. Um, our emails are right, you know, on the website. Please feel free to, if you have a question, uh, Mark and I will always, you know, respond. Uh, can't say we'll respond right away. But we will always respond to try to answer your questions and help you in any way that we can. Right. I have a question. Sure. <laughs> I have a question about, like, I hear different things. Like, uh, I'm an athlete, and I hear different professional athlete, and I hear different things about, like, sponsorships and, like, campaigns. And, like, so I'm just wondering kind of, like, the difference in a sense. Like, I, I, I kind of get it. Like, I know the sponsor sponsorship is probably on like a bigger level but is it in some sense the same as like a campaign can like a company do like a campaign for another company or is it just like I guess one is just somebody's doing something and they're getting paid for it or I'm just kind of hey, let me let me speak, speak to that a little bit okay. so when I, th I think of a sponsorship I think of uh, a, a particular uh, athlete like maybe you know Under Armour uh, okay I think one of the things Under Armour did a couple of years ago that was sort of really out of the box was they sponsored uh, a dancer. They sponsored uh, Misty yeah. Copeland, who, you know, which, which I thought yeah, was I genius. That. So yeah. that's sort of the sponsorship aspect. And then I would say the campaign maybe includes the activation of it, where the campaign would be, hey, they did digital advertising. They took out an ad in the uh, New York City Ballet program or maybe mm -hmm. they actually had her part of the activation was they had her go out and appear at different local schools and talk up, okay. you know, the power of dance movement. And of course, you know, tout the Under Armour brand. So okay. I would say just in terms of, of uh, names and definitions, those, yeah. those, those would be okay. the differences. Okay. Um, so Jessica, what sport do you do? Yeah, uh, Track and field. That's what I thought. What's your event? What? Uh, the 400 meters. Wow. What's your time? Uh, my PB is 50.08, so I'm trying to run sub-50, hopefully this right. year, because I'm trying to retire. <laughs> so I have a question. Uh, so when you guys talk about, like, impre not impression, but, like, engagement, how valuable is that? Like, I think about sometimes if somebody engages, but it doesn't necessarily, like, result to a sale, would you still say, like, oh, because people – you know, because people came across it or they checked it out, but they didn't actually have like a action behind it. Would you still consider that like, you know, when it comes to, cause I hear, you know, engagement all the time, like with, through social media, like, oh, what, what they really care about is engagement now. It's not about like likes and it's not about, you know, they want to know that people are saving it or people are commenting. That passes. So when I think of engagement, as far as like, I guess on the, the sponsorship level, like, is it really beneficial if, there's a lot of engagement, but there's no like, 
people are talking about it, but then it's like done the next day or it's not, there's no sales from it or there's no, or not a, as many. Does that make sense? Because I feel like if there's 10,000 engagements, but you know, maybe only 10 people purchase something or a hundred people purchase something like, would you consider that like successful or would you, I, I don't feel like it is, but I don't know. Cause I'm, I don't know this part of the industry, Neil, but I, I think that's your, that's your <laughs> category. So, Jessica, I think, you know, when you talk about engagement, that's something that Mark and I are actually looking into, especially as it as it relates to the NIL situation, name, image, likeness, which is maybe something that you're going to get involved in, you know, somewhere down the line in order to maybe take a little bit advantage of your notoriety. You know, what's happened is, though, is that people have, uh, let's say, equated um, engagement with just having an, a large number of followers. You know, Kim Kardashian has 160 million followers on Instagram. And I'm like, well, big deal. But tell me about the, how many people shared, you know, her posts? How many people engaged or commented on that post? Now you're right. Like is the lowest form of engagement that somebody could have. Well, actually reading it is the lowest form of engagement, but liking, commenting, sharing. So being able to understand the relationship between those kind of different areas is really what engagement is all about. We're, we're actually looking into that, um, Jessica, and is something that, you know, Mark and I are definitely paying attention to right now. Um, you know, as, as I said, we're working on something new um, in the area of NIL. And again, as a college athlete, that might be something that 